Today we're going to talk about the biology of stress. One of our favorite topics. It is because I, I know that I know that I and, and I think I'm pretty sure that you do as well. Talk about this mechanism often with right. patients. Um, we certainly talk about it with our students. We but teach we talk it. about right. it uh, mm -hmm. with patients all the time. Right. right. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about different uh, brain and general body structures mm -hmm. associated with the stress response because as we've talked about before uh, when we think about things biologically stress is a physiological biological reaction right it, it is a it is a mechanism that is enacted when we're in certain circumstances that um, that starts with our hypothalamus and ends with us feeling very nervous and right. <laughs> fearful. When, when this whole concept of stress was first articulated mm -hmm. by Hans Selye, uh, it was a biological response right. from the very beginning. He took an engineering term, mm -hmm. stress, the stress that you have on materials like steel, mm -hmm. how much stress can it endure before it breaks. Right. Um, but from the very beginning, Hans Selye understood that stress was a biological Mm -hmm. process okay right. and I think that you need to understand that because whether you're talking about a temper tantrum or anger or mm -hmm. whatever whatever those kind of very uh, intense emotions are it involves uh, similar brain structures right. okay but but these are biological responses so when you say well I should be able to control this maybe you can and maybe you can't right. because they are supposed to occur right that's that's number one these feelings are supposed to occur because they're adaptive, they keep right. us alive. Right. So these are biological functions coming from the brain. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so when we think about this stress response, what we're referring to is something called the HPA, the hypothalamic <laughs> pituitary adrenal axis. This is when it would be good to have a technician who's typing all this stuff in and he appears on the, the next slide, right? I, I, I'm going to try to to get all I'm these things in. Put that in there. I, I, yeah. It's hard to do. See, you got me distracted now. I'm thinking about the, the technology the videos of this. And yes, right. because I I want our videos to be so much better. Right. But um, hypothalamic refers to the hypothalamus, right? Which is a structure that sits just behind your eyeballs, right? Okay. And it, and it um, it begins the process that then goes to our uh, pituitary yeah. gland. Yeah, think of the hypothalamus as a cluster of grapes, champagne, mm -hmm. cha those little tiny champagne grapes. And each grape produces a different hormone. Yeah. Okay, so the hypoth hypothalamus produces your hormones. Right. The hormones, when they're released, drip into the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. Hypothalamic, pituitary, pituitary. axis. And it goes all the way down to our adrenal glands. Right. Then it goes down. On top of our kidneys. Right. Then all those hormones go down to the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. And when the adrenal glands get stimulated, they obviously produce adrenaline mm -hmm. because the adrenal glands produce adrenaline and that's the flight or fight response right and that's what that's what gets us into the fight or flight right. um, in response to some and why would our brains do that to keep us safe that's right because what starts this cascade it's usually a stimulus from the environment that lets our that tells our brain or that our brain interprets as being dangerous right there's something in the environment that, that's dangerous, right. and, and so your brain senses that, mm -hmm. um, either a sound or a sight or a smell or something. Right. Your brain senses danger, and it triggers two little tiny structures called the amygdala. Right. Right? Yeah. And the amygdala are um, under your eyes. Yeah, the little grape. Like almond-shaped almond structures. Shape. Right. Uh, amygdala means almond. Okay, yeah. that's how it translates as almond. They're little almond-shaped structures that sit, like, what would you say, a little bit below your eyes. Yeah, okay? just like kind of right there. Right, so below the hypothalamus, mm -hmm. okay? So the hypothalamus is behind your eyes, and then the amygdala are just yes, a little bit below that, with right. one on each side of your brain. And when those amygdala sense danger, right. they fire an electrical discharge to the hypothalamus. It goes it around to the started. back of your brain, goes to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus re um, produces the hormones. Right. So that sort of circle of structures produces the hormones that send you into fight or flight. And once again, we want that to happen. If you're in a situation where there's a bear, you want that system in it to, to become right. active to get you to safety. Right. If you didn't recognize the danger, you wouldn't 
act. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so whether it's squealing tires or a gunshot or a loud explosion or some noxious smell in the air, uh, regardless of how your sensory system is uh, stimulated, it goes to the amygdala mm -hmm. for, and the amygdala processes it before you even think about it. Right. Okay. You know, this isn't something you stand around and, right. and analyze. Yeah. You want a very quick sudden response. Yeah. And so you get it when the amygdala gets activated. And, and just to throw one more structure in there, <laughs> that, that is think, uh, thankful to your uh, thalamus. Your thalamus kind of... I wasn't going to mention that. I like the thalamus. <laughs> I know, um, the thalamus is like Grand Central Station. It's like and the it, Atlanta airport. Yes. Yeah. Um, Everything has to go to Atlanta. It does. Right? And, and so all of your senses go there and then it, they're usually shuttled to the right mm -hmm. uh, cortex to process that information, that sensory okay. information. But when it senses, um, when the thalamus senses something dangerous, um, mm -hmm. it will send it to the amygdala and then that start that process. Right. And just footnote, in teenagers, everything goes to the amygdala first. Right. And then it goes to the thinking part of the brain. So right. if a teenager thinks, that eh, this isn't bad, they're probably gonna act on it. Because right. everything, goes, the, the amygdala processes before the rest of the brain processes. Right. That helps to explain why teenagers are a little volatile, right. a little anxious, a little angry. Now, Testy. again, this process <clears throat> is supposed to happen. One of the reasons why we mention some of these structures so specifically is because right next to the amygdala right. is another extremely interesting um, structure mm -hmm. called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is critical to the formation of memories. Makes new, that's what makes new memories, Right. the hippocampus. And because the amygdala is so close to the hippocampus, mm -hmm. it's, that's the reason why many of the highly emotional memories that you have are so strong. That's right. Um, because all the emotion <clears throat> comes there from the, from the amygdala, uh, we have a tendency to uh, have very strong, vivid, um, important memories that are associated with highly emotional circumstances. Which makes sense right. because you want to remember what's dangerous. Right. I mean, you don't care if it's not dangerous. I right. mean, it, but if something is dangerous, you want to remember it every time. Right. And so, as nature would have it, the amygdala sits just in front of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. and those two things work together. In fact, some people call them the amygdaloid hippocampal structure, like it's mm -hmm. a single structure. They're not, they're two different structures, but they work closely together. Mm -hmm. So highly emotional events get remembered. Right. Okay. Um, the smell of flowers, mm -hmm. the, you know, perfumes and good and bad, right? Good and bad, good and bad. Um, and so we want to remember what's dangerous. All right. Now I want to, and I'm going to throw, uh -oh. I'm going to do a throwback very quickly this. to last week. Remember last week we were, last Friday, we were talking about... Oh, last week. Yeah. We were talking about, um, again, we're not going to make it political, but we're going to talk about how this, how this worked because the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, Dr. Yes. Um, Ford. I always, wonder, I always forget her name. Dr. Ford, um, if, we, if we just look at her memory, her reported memory of those events, uh, mm -hmm. she didn't remember how she got there. Not emotionally important. She didn't remember what time she got there. Not emotionally important, but she reported to remember the what, what she um, identified as the assault. Right. That was highly emotionally um, stimulating. Of all the things that happened to her that day, that, that was, was the a, most salient. That was the most right. important. And I mean, so that would make sense that she would remember that, right. but not some of these other details because those details were not emotionally charged. Right. That yeah. event was, and that's why she would potentially remember that more so than she would remember any of the other things. Right. That's right. Um, and so we have to always keep that in mind when we're looking at, when, we're, uh, when people report memories that are inconsistent or you know, they, they, they have a strong memory of one piece of a day but not other pieces of a day, mm -hmm. that you, sometimes you have those kinds of issues coming at play. Right, right. Um, it's also, can I talk about blackout? Yeah. People talk about getting, having a blackout. Mm -hmm. They're able to drive their car, they order food, mm -hmm. they eat food. They have no recollection of it. Right. 
they're able to do it consciously. Mm -hmm. It's just that they don't have any memory of it because right. the alcohol interfered with memory because right. alcohol does that. Right. It affects the hippocampus. Right. So you're able to do everything just fine, but you don't have any recollection of it. Right. And just fine would be uh, sort well, of subjective. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had people say to me, well, I, I, I went to my car the next morning and there were three um, hamburger wrappers right. on the front seat and I don't remember ordering them. I don't remember driving to, to McDonald's, ordering them or eating them. Right. But there are the wrappers right there, mm -hmm. okay, after a night of heavy drinking. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any memory of it. Right. Okay. So uh, once again, you can interfere with memory mm -hmm. um, with alcohol or, or other drugs, um, or it can be disrupted in any number of ways. But if something is really important, if something is really significant, you tend to remember it. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and that, again, is because the, the amygdaloid structures are right next to the hippocampus, which creates those memories. And in yesterday's podcast, we talked about acute stress or short-term stress can enhance memory mm -hmm. because you have a little bit more arousal, a little mm -hmm. bit more attention, you're a little more focused, it's a little bit more important, and so it enhances right. memory. Uh, it can also overwhelm memory. Right, mm -hmm. and so the problem um, arises, comes about when stress is chronic. Right. When we, when this system, the, the amygdala, the, in the, um, the, that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the more that that remains stimulated, the more problematic it becomes because then you start getting into um, various forms of fatigue. You become, you get in, in right. to the issues of um, chronic exposure to some of the hormones that we are only really supposed to be exposed to temporarily, right. um, whether it's cortisol, um, adrenaline, and some of the other, um, um, norepinephrine and some of the other um, chemicals that are released during this whole process. And it takes a toll on our immune system, it takes a toll on our uh, overall cognitive functioning, right. um, and it really is not a, a good Situation. Right. But here again, we talk about this very delicate balance in our brains. Mm -hmm. um, we said yesterday and, and a little bit today that the corticosteroids that are produced mm -hmm. when, when we're stressed right. enhance, can enhance our physical health and mm -hmm. our memory. But long-term exposure damages the... Here's the irony of this. It, it Short-term exposure to cortisol enhances memory mm -hmm. because it enhances the hippocampal functioning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Long-term exposure to corticosteroids damages the hippocampus, right. okay? So when we talk about short-term stress and chronic stress, we're talking about two very different effects. Right. Short-term stress enhances hippocampal function. Long-term chronic stress damages the hippocampus. Right. Uh, physically damages it, mm -hmm. okay? So one is okay, one is not okay. Right, absolutely. So, so <clears throat> again, the stress is a biological... Biological problem. function. And so it serves a, a, an important, life-saving, critical, right. evolutionary survival um, function. And we, so we need it to happen. Uh, the problem, of course, always comes about when we are dealing with it over long periods of time right. in a chronic state um, and that's when we start to have problems and so over the next couple of days we're going to talk about what that's like right. um, you know the relationship between stress and psychopathology stress and uh, various um, right. various consequences uh, of stress and we'll eventually on Saturday get to yeah. um, ma how to manage stress managing it and treating it right. and all that right so mm -hmm. So, it, but I'm glad we talked about this short-term, long-term, right. um, because it's the same biological process. Right. Short-term could be helpful, long-term can be damaging. Right. right, and it's going to be critical as we talk about treatment, you know, how to right. reduce the effects of, of stress, because the goal, of course, then, is to calm these structures down. Right. So, yep. all right, that is it Good. for today. Mm -hmm. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. Mm -hmm.